Eric Smith uh, to take over, to come and uh, give us the opening uh, presentation. No drum roll? No drum roll, sorry. Jean Dobre. Hopefully I said that correctly. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Derek Smith. I saw some of you uh, yesterday. Thank you. And I'll spend a little bit of time uh, talking about uh, a more uh, depressing subject, but it is part of my, my work. Um, again, I'm an associate professor uh, at the University of San Francisco. Uh, that's in San Francisco, California, in the United States. I am a former high school teacher and a former high school principal as well, as well as spent some time doing higher education policy in the United States for the community colleges, which are our two-year uh, colleges in the States. Uh, but today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the uh, thing that I work the most on in the States, which is issues of uh, school violence. Much of my work is in confronting um, issues of school toxicity in some of our more violent areas in the United States. For those that are not aware, uh, the United States has a pretty high homicide rate due to its access to um, uh, high profile weapons. Uh, in certain states, uh, we have 50 states in that country, of course, and some of those states don't even require a permit or a person to register to have a firearm or a uh, submachine gun, uh, which leads to a whole host of problems both on and off of school campuses. Uh, but much of my work focuses in the areas that are mostly impacted by such violence, uh, and I work with schools that, have, uh, uh, that are in areas with abnormally high homicide rates. Uh, and so I'll talk a little bit about uh, this issue of children's rights in the context of schools as institutions that not only can develop and empower individuals, but also have histories of causing great harm and um, imbalance within our social structure. So one of the things I want to start with here uh, is the basic fundamental data that we have rough, roughly 246 million children and adolescents experiencing school violence and bullying. Um, and this is really important because if you think in terms of larger constructs of child harm, uh, such as students or young children that experience violence, ages two to four, we have roughly 300 million children in the world, ages two to four, that experience some form of violence at home or from a supervisor or a supervising adult. Um, when you think of that age group in itself uh, experiencing that much violence, and then we think of what's happening um, in schools and in related to schools, we have a world in which schools can participate in a very violent situation. One of the reasons why this is important for educators is because most educators are not prepared or trained in this reality. They are trained to perpetuate how schools function. They are trained to make sure students learn curriculum, but they are rarely, if ever, trained in actual student safety or a protective ethic. And so what we end up doing as institutions around the world is that we tend to ignore the actual day-to-day -day safety of the children that we serve, which leads to a whole host of psychological and emotional manifestations of trauma uh, and depending on the actual nation that we are in, we can then lead to stereotyping or further marginalizing students because of what they, uh, the particular behaviors they are exhibiting. Um, but without placing any onus or significance in how schools function or are dysfunction, dysfunctional regarding student safety. So some of the key points that uh, I want to talk about um, are in relation to this dynamic. Um, at my university, I am the co-director of our principal certification program for um, our students, our graduate students that are trying to become uh, <laughs> uh, primary and secondary principals. I also work in the East Asian Regional Council of Overseas Schools that trains principals in Southeast Asian international schools. Um, typically, our perspectives on these things are simply as teachers. Um, and 
our other angles of research are as social service and counselors. But one area that is often skipped is those of us who are responsible for how schools run. And that's where my work tends to focus. When we think about school violence and bullying, we want to understand that since students spend, children spend much of their day definitely in developed nations and even in less developed nations as, as families pursue uh, their dream of having children have access to education, children will spend most of their a awake lives in a school setting. Once they come home, they will do chores, they might even work, they will often sleep, and when they're up again, they'll come and see educators, and they will be in schools most of the day. Many of you spent much of your childhood lives awake in a school setting. So if we then understand that schools have historically had problems, have problems of keeping children safe, then we literally spend a lot of our years in unsafe environments. Uh, and we are often encouraged to distract ourselves from that lack of safety by focusing on our test scores and our grades and our evaluations and impressing folks. And what ends up happening is that we sacrifice a lot of our mental and emotional health for achievement. So the problem with that, of course, is that various types of victimization that occurs can go under-discussed and thus under-addressed. Uh, when we think of issues of bullying, we often, uh, at least in the research, researchers note that bullying can involve things such as simple as exclusion from particular school activities or social activities to things that are more uh, contact-oriented, such as physical harassment, tripping, spitting, on individuals. Um, oftentimes it takes the form in terms of rumors uh, or some types of uh, verbal harassment. Um, and those are the various forms in which most research um, focuses on regarding bullying. But when we think about schools and the diversity of the human experience and what threats and harassment can feel like, a lot of our research around the world leaves out certain incidences of harassment and harm that should be associated with threats to children's rights and safety. Things such as extortion, people taking money from children. A lot of our discussion in bullying is often separated from sexual harassment in the targeting of more vulnerable groups. Um, a lot of issues regarding gang recruitment and other forms of pressure are often ignored as well. And so what we end up having is a, an entire population of teachers and educators that are actually trained to ignore some of the most significant aspects of a child's daily life while they are under their care. And so when we also think about this issue, we have this question of the more vulnerable populations experiencing higher rates. Uh, when we look at uh, data uh, gathered from UNESCO and UNICEF, what we find is throughout all of the various regions of the world, whether it's North America, whether it's Europe, whether it's Sub-Saharan Africa, whether it's the Middle East or uh, Northern Africa uh, or Latin America, what we're finding is that mostly bullying rates for children um, ages 5 to 18 are pretty much similar from one region to the next. On average, most regions in the world experience a reporting rate of 30% of children are experiencing some form of bullying. In any particular region or particular locale, that can go up to as high as 70%. Um, in most areas, though, it seems to be around 30%. Once we get into sub-Saharan Africa and what people deem as the Middle East or North Africa, those rates are higher in the 46% to 40% uh, area. But when we think about m marginalized populations, such as uh, girls, for example, those numbers can fluctuate and be mostly higher than boys in many of these scenarios. And when we think about bullying and harassment that occurs for young girls, we also want to think about the psychological effects and academic effects of that. Um, of girls that are, tend to be bullied and harassed in the United States, uh, 25 percent, excuse me, 25 percent of them experience some form of sleep deprivation or school avoidance. 
which leads to, of course, decreased academic performance. Sometimes this avoidance can be passed off stereotypically as some sort of emotional dilemma and not associated with the environment that schools have actually created and allowed. We also think of LGBTQ students um, around the world, but definitely in my host country, we found that LGBTQ students experience bullying at a rate of 70% reported, which is incredibly high for our students that identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender, or queer. Another group that is often not think to, uh, thought about is our refugee or recent immigrant populations, something that um, countries neighboring to um, our, our fellow uh, citizens and friends in Ukraine are going to have to be dealing with for the next several years. When a country is taking in large amounts of refugee, refugees or immigration uh, participants coming in from a conflict area, we want to remember that we are bringing them into school systems that are not actually very good at taking care of their current citizens. And so what ends up happening is the othering that occurs from these dynamics um, leaves uh, our refugee populations incredibly vulnerable as they try to learn new languages, learn the new culture, learn the academic system itself, and then find a way to trust adults to actually tell about their victimization, when again, internationally, the highest averages we have on students reporting that they've been bullied, bullied or assault, assaulted to educators is about 40 to 42 percent. So we have less than half of our students even reporting when these things happen. What do you think is going to happen when we have refugees and immigrant populations coming into these scenarios? Okay, I should close soon. I think I've been talking a while. Um, so what do we do with this? Um, if we're experiencing these dynamics of school violence and safety, uh, much of the recommendations, uh, you know, even UNESCO uh, had a great conference on international school bullying uh, with the French Foreign Ministry helping to sponsor that um, event. And there were a series of recommendations that came down. I feel very technical talking about this up here. This is actually a very personal thing for me. Um, many, many young people, <clears throat> it's important for us to understand that as we want to express love and concern for students in our pedagogy, in our practices, in our work, many of us want to serve as agents for social justice and improving the experience for children. We want to remember that oftentimes in our training has been situated a certain level of neglect and a certain level of participation in the very institutions that cause children harm. Oftentimes our ideas of who we are and what we came to do as educators and social servants and researchers in serving humanity ignores the reality that we were trained by the very institutions that caused the need for social justice movements in the first place. We have to be reflective on our idea of what it means to be elite, what it means to have status, what it means to be educated, what it means to be doctored. If we have been able to achieve all of these marks of greatness within a system that has been harming our very own families and communities for generations. So when we think about our perceptions, not only of the systems that we're in, but our roles within these systems, we want to remember that our social movement and social justice work has to begin with an introspective a self-analysis of the biases that we bring, of the limitations that we bring, in the expectations that we have been taught to have about our own capacities and the greatness thereof, and the lack of capacity of some of the students and the people that we serve. We have a tremendous ability to do good. But remember, we were trained in systems that are very much interested in maintaining the status quo in the order of things as they are. So in closing, sorry, okay, <laughs> that the shifts that are recommended internationally are not just shifts in policy. We've had shifts in policy. The, the UN covenant on children's rights, I think it was, 
almost every country signed into that covenant, except for a few in sub-Saharan Africa and my own in the United States. We still have 29, we have 29 states out of 50 in my country, only 29 out of 50 that sign policies against corporal punishment in schools. That's in a democratic nation, okay? So what we wanna be concerned with is not just the entities that we oppose, but we also wanna be concerned with how we have been trained to sit in alignment with the very systems we oppose. And in that, as educators, we want to take not only our children's academic achievement seriously, we want to take seriously the gaps in our own training, the gaps in our own abilities, and the gaps in our own sensibilities to actually address the needs of our children. I'll shut up there. Thank you. Thank you so much for this inspiring talk. I think we'll be reflecting on it for the whole day. Very Im big impact. Um, I, I would like to invite Dr. Tore Sorensen uh, to, to give his uh, speech now. And the floor is yours.